Hi. Listen, we live in America, and we believe it is the best place in the world to live. We have migrants coming in by the thousands trying to seek our life here. And rightly so. Um, people look at us as the leader of the free world and, uh, and defender of that also. And that's a justified uh, appearance. But if you ask people in the world if it's the best place to live right now, you might get some different opinions from different people. Like most free countries, most democratic countries, we have a system that is both capitalistic and socialistic. Now, people don't want to hear that because they, in America now, we have a large divide and people are either promoting a highly capitalistic society or a highly socialistic society. And that, that's very evident in the current problem that Joe Biden is dealing with now, even with his own party, uh, the Democrats. You know, the, there are more conservative Democrats that lean towards fiscal responsibility, et cetera, and they're or more liberal members of his party that lean towards uh, social programs, so like uh, Medicare for all, edu free education, and those kinds of things. And the fact is, uh, most democratic societies have both. The question becomes how you manage those and to what degree you manage those and to what level the people in those countries perceive how you manage those as being successful. Right now, we're having a real hard time struggling with that in the United States of America. People are struggling with the whole concept of whether we should have an all white society. We have a whole segment of people who are aimed at that. We have people who don't want any government control in just about anything and have created militias to defend that perspective. We have communities that are focused on really enhancing the corporations and the free capital or the free trade groups and the, and the capitalistic end of our society to the exclusion of social programs to take care of people who can't afford to do them which has created a broad, broad inequality in our income status in America. So what regulates that? What, what helps control that? And right now, that's a struggle in the United States of America. It's a struggle because we have not adjusted to the balance between capitalism and social. And I want to give you some examples. First, a little bit of knowledge about capitalism and socialism. And, and then we'll take a look at countries that are perceived in terms of quality of life and economic success. Okay, the first thing I want to show you is this article from ThoughtCo. And you can see it up here at the top, ThoughtCo. And if you add .com, you'll be able to go straight to them. In this particular case, you're talking about socialism versus capitalism. What is the difference? And I thought this was a really pretty good overview uh, of what capitalism and socialism is about. So here are some <clears throat> key takeaways from these. Socialism is an economic and political system under which means of production are publicly owned. Uh, production and consumer prices are controlled by the government and best meet the needs of all of the people. Capitalism is an economic system under which means the production and privately owned production. Consumer prices are based on free market systems. Socialism most often criticized for its provision of social service programs requiring high taxes that decelerate economic growth. Capital, and that's not necessarily always true. They don't necessarily always decelerate 
economic growth. They can increase it, which we've seen under Joe Biden during the pandemic. Capitalism is most often criticized for its tendency to allow income and quality and stratification of socioeconomic classes, which is what we're really experiencing right now. So here are some of the things that we find interesting. Capitalism is a means of production. It's owned by private indi individuals. Income determined by free market forces, not necessarily about whether people's needs or not. Prices determined by supply and demand. Free market competition encourages efficiency, innovation. And so this is one of the real positive aspects about capitalism, people, is we really get a chance to see growth and changes in leadership. The problem is when you globalize that picture, uh, people in the United States don't always benefit from that innovation. It may be going somewhere else or it, the rich people may be benefiting, but the people who are benefiting at the middle class level are the employees that these companies outsource to other countries. Healthcare provided by private sector. And that means simply that our healthcare system is owned by companies and you have to ask a question, and I do a whole series on this on YouTube under a different program. I think it's called What the Flip, uh, where I look at the healthcare system, broke it down piece by piece, why our healthcare system is actually sick. And a large portion of that is because of the capitalistic approach to healthcare healthcare. Uh, limited taxes based on individual income. Now, socialism, on the other hand, the means of production are owned by the government, cooperatives. In other words, it belongs to everybody. If, if the people are truly uh, uh, in control of the government and not a dictator, this does not work under dictators. Socialism under people uh, like the guy down in Venezuela, Russia, China, in those areas, these people, uh, Cuba, these people, and many of Africa and Mideastern countries, these people are not uh, in, a, in a free society. Uh, so socialism, they're, in terms of how it's defined here, is not necessarily happening in those countries. Those are dictatorships. Those are fascist countries. They're not socialistic countries necessarily. Income equality distributed according to need. Prices set by the government. Government-owned businesses have less incentive for efficiency and innovation. So they're really looking just to take care of the basic needs of people. If you want to lead in the chip industry world, you, you need innovation. And that's one of the dilemmas about socialism is it doesn't create that need to innovate. Uh, or even the desire sometimes there may, may be resistance to it. Okay, now what this article tends to look at comes from countries today, and again, I'll put these in the description of the video, uh, is politically and economically most stable countries of the world, okay? Uh, so we kind of have to ask ourselves, what's that entail? So the nations that have political and economic stability, along with better living conditions are considered to be the stable countries. So we're looking at stability and economic conditions. European countries have the most balanced economies. That is why most of these countries of the world are found in Europe. In the index, the countries that have the lowest score on considered are considered to be the safest. Those with a higher score are the unstable and unbalanced nations. So you, you look at countries that are the most stable right here is a list of these countries, Finland, Sweden, uh, Germany, Singapore, Norway, Australia, France, Switzerland, Luxembourg, Netherlands, United Kingdom, Denmark, New Zealand, Portugal, Iceland, Canada, Belgium, Ireland, and Slovenia. <laughs> of all places. Uh, you got me. Uh, down below a list are the countries that are most stable, and they have a low fragility score, which means their stability is strong. 
So these are the fragility scores over here. So what we have here is, you know, starting from the top to the bottom, Finland is probably this the most stable country uh, in the world. And it, it also ranks as one of the more uh, pleasant places to live in the world. And we'll see why in just a few moments. But you can take it a few minutes and go down and uh, put these in, you know, this is just a summation of that chart we just looked at. Now, here's some reasons why Ireland, the Republic of Ireland secures the sixth rank in the most stable nations as per GDP uh, per capita, the country is among the wealthiest ones in the world. The nation has an economic freedom score of 80.4 and is on the, and is on the sixth rank worldwide. Iceland is 20.3. Iceland comes in fifth on the list of having stability index of 20.3. This tertiary education and universal health care are available in the nation through the Nordic social welfare system. It ranks fifth in the nations with medium wealth index. Adding to that, the country also is one of the countries with the highest economic and social stability. Uh, and so that Iceland uh, steps in there. Denmark is fourth. Denmark is another European country that stands fourth on the list of the national fertility uh, scale. The stability index of the country is 19.8. It is considered to be one of the most economically and socially developed nations in the world. A high standard of living is enjoyed by the Danes. Adding to the country ranks high on several metrics that define the strength and stability of a nation, healthcare, education, protection of civil liberties, human development, and prosperity is quite exceptional in this Scandinavian country. Okay, so those are some of the things that people are enjoying there. Switzerland, where my heritage is, is Switzerland is well known to be one of the countries that are neutral. It stands third on the list of most stable nations with a score of 19.2. The country does not participate in any of the external problems due to the less interference of other states. The country is quite safe. The main purpose of the armed forces of Switzerland is to maintain law and order within the country. They are basically the law and order group of the country. So, uh, they're not protecting against people who are attacking them uh, so much because they basically have a history of taking a new, neutral stance instead of getting involved in world affairs that lead to wars. All the neighboring, even during World War II, they were neutral. All the neighboring countries of Switzerland are part of the European Union, but the country itself is not part of the EU became part of the United Nations back in 2002. State agencies are internally dependent on each other due to the federal structure of the state. As a result, the government is quite reliable. Free market policy prevails in the country, and there are proper rules and regulations for that. Adding to that, other sectors, including health and education, are adequately developed, and so you could feel fairly pretty comfortable people are receiving education and health care. Following uh, Finland, Norway is one of the most stable uh, nations in the world. The country has an index score of 18.3, according to the study. Uh, it's one of the most developed nations in the world with a stable econo economy and politics. The country is known to be one of the safest countries on the planet. Most of the developed countries face many problems, including a high crime rate, but that's not the case with Norway. The crime rate is quite low as compared to the other countries. Adding to that, living conditions are quite friendly and highly sustainable. There are very few cases of public violations. The press of Norway has provided freedom along with a proper constitution that ensures the protection of the press and media. The nation has never seen, been, or the nation has never been in a state of civil unrest. That's pretty phenomenal. That's pretty phenomenal. That would be a nice feeling. 
Uh, Finland, as per the capital uh, index study or the fragile state index study, Finland is the most stable country in the world and it has the least score in the fragile index. The country was also ranked first on the list of the safest nations as per the travel and tourism competitiveness report of 2017. It is one of the best governed countries on the planet. The system of healthcare is quite developed and is free for the public. The education system provides a world-class education. As per the 2017 Travel and Tourism Competitiveness Report, Finland is one of the safest places on the planet Earth. The judiciary of Finland is ranked to be highly independent judiciary. Healthcare is free in Finland, and the nation also enjoys world-class education. So there you have some countries that are actually um, balancing this idea of capitalism and socialism to the point where they are so desirable to live. So what this means is uh, we have people who are fighting over things they ought to be unifying, not fighting over. Uh, we should be using our skill sets and our leadership and our leaders and our governing bodies to create what's called synergy. That's different than compromise. I think that's one of the big things that we have a problem with in our government personally. You know, for years I consulted in business and for years, uh, you saw where the difference between people trying to compromise and or control and people who would put together teams of people to work in a synergistic way that created product better than any one of those individual teams or groups or departments could have done on their own. As, as smart as they may be, uh, that synergy is what helps uh, create the ideas that will make you be able to adjust to all the external influences affecting you out there. And that's what's going on in our government right now. We, we, have, fa we have factions of people who believe they're fighting for the right thing, when in fact, they're becoming a barrier to the success of our country, whether they're uh, Republicans and conservative Republicans or far right Republicans or whether they're liberal Democrats or uh, conservative Democrats. Uh, when you put yourself in a niche like that and you're not looking at what are the issues that are causing America to stumble, and right now, those issues are health care. Our health care system sucks. It is in the tubes. And we've seen this with the pandemic. The second thing is we have economic inequality far greater than anybody else in the world right now. Our disparity is so bad that, you know, people are literally, I mean, when you have people going to food lines, to, to, to survive in a country, you are not taking care of your people. You're not focused on all the people. Most importantly, you're not focused on that one quote that I will go back to from that first article we read, and that's the general welfare. The preamble to the Constitution says the government is responsible for the general welfare, not the welfare of the rich, not the welfare of corporations, not the welfare of politicians, but the welfare of the general public. That's everybody who is in these, in, who resides within this country and all our states and all our holdings. So this is important for us to understand. Capitalism isn't the answer. Socialism isn't the answer. Together, they are the answer. But they will fail they will fail miserably and this country will fail until the leadership of this country refocus their roles. Their roles are to operate in the interest of the general welfare of this country.
which means you can't have all of the socialistic programs you want because it's not in the best interest of everybody in this country. You can't have a no social welfare programs, no programs taking care of people who are in need because that's not in the best interest of the general welfare of this country. So if you're sitting in Congress right now, you need to just take the word compromise and throw it out the damn door. Force everybody in the room and give them porta potties in the room if they need them. And don't let them come out till they come up with a product that helps everybody in America live a quality life. That's health care. That's education. That's freedom from debt. That's, um, you know, security, a sense of security and well being. And that's everybody. That's not just white people. It's not just black people. It, it's everybody. Okay. Together, all of us together. When everybody is posturing, we might come close to having an equality in a country that's livable like Finland or Norway, okay? Which sounds much more appealing than the United States right now. So please, stop all the bickering, stop all the fighting, stop all the fuss. We got a pandemic getting killing people. We got people saying they don't want to wear masks, which can keep from killing people. And, and that's a selfish attitude. And that's been created by the leadership who profess a particular point of view that is not in the best interest of the general welfare of the people. Okay. General welfare includes all. Your freedom stops or my freedom begins. Just that simple. And you can't live in that kind of society until you grasp that concept. Employers create employment. Corporation and capitalism create employment and wealth for people. However, employees sustain employment and make that wealth capable of growing for everybody employees and employers, as long as you have that balance, as long as employers see employees in that light, and as long as employees see employers in that light, and they can actually live together in a conducive way that makes it beneficial for everyone. Till we get there, we're gonna struggle. We're going to fight. People are going to have stress. This pandemic should have been over July if everybody would have lined up. If everybody would line up with the science as it's been delivered and not listen to religious philosophies, not listen to political philosophies, not listen to anything, just listen to the things that will keep you alive, this pandemic would be in the bag in history. And we would all be going out there being brothers and sisters with each other again. I look forward to that time. This is Victor Vogel. You can find more about how to build trust and how to build leadership under victorvogel.com. Till the next session, please, please come together. Without it, we're going to fall. It's kind of embarrassing for Norway and Finland to be a better place to live than the United States. Think about that.